On this episode, I have two iconic guests. And I throw a right hook for a book that's not my own? <laughs> you ask questions and I answer them. This is the Ask Gary V Show. It's Gary Vay Nerdchuck, and this is episode 89 of the Ask Gary V Show. As you can tell, this is only the second time, is this the second time? Casey, right? Only Casey, the second yeah. time we've ever had a guest, and we've doubled it up. Um, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really excited, as many of you know who watch the show. Uh, Jack, Susie, and I did a, a great talk at South by Southwest. Uh, I've really gotten to spend some nice time with them over the last couple of months. Obviously, I have known about them, known them a little bit, and gotten to know them more and more. And so this is super fun for me, for you guys to be on the show. I appreciate it. We um, appreciate being here. Well, why don't you tell the Vayner Nation how you've been, what are you guys up to, who you are for the one or two people that don't know. Let's let's do that. Susie, All go right. first. Well, I, we're here because we love you so much, Gary. But we're Thank here you. because we got a new book out. It's called The Real Life MBA. We're going around talking to people about the ideas in it. It's an MBA in a book. All right, you know, uh, as way of background, you know, Jack has got a long uh, history in, uh, in business, and, and I'm his writing partner, editorial partner. I've done a lot in business myself. Jack? Yeah. And I've been uh, building a school in the last few years, the Jack Welch Management Institute. We are granting MBAs and we're growing at 40% a year. We're up to 900 students, 38 years old, average age. And it's so much fun to see them progress through their companies. 65% of the graduates have gotten promotions while they were there. 18% uh, percent is the average raise of a student at the school while they're there. So it's been a great Benefit. And tell them about your back career, and I mean your 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 semi-pro hockey career. Oh yeah, that was a very weak, <laughs> very weak program. <laughs> Fortunately, I thought I was a stud when I was in high school. Uh, captained everything, won all these awards, and I went to college and played against Canadians. <laughs> and I quickly really realized that I stunk. <laughs> <laughs> all right, India, let's get into the show. We got some questions. We do. Let's do it. Youssef wants to know how important is failure. You hear a bunch of people saying how important it is to fail, but is it really? Yusef, uh, great question. You know, look, I think failure has to be quantified. If you fail that you never can get up from it again, you know, that's not a good failure. I think, I think failure and adversity are the two things I think about. For me, as an entrepreneur, and very entrepreneurial, and always in my own stuff, all the failures along the way, even going back to like the baseball card show when I was 13 that I paid $400 for a table and nobody showed up to that baseball card show, that was a learning lesson. Mm -hmm. Those micro failures were super, super important. I think, you know, it depends on your stomach, right? Like if you, if you really fail, like go out of business, I think people take one of two ways, right? They're like just finished and they're never able to get off the mat and they go in a different direction. So to me, I think quantifying the failure is important to me. Jack, Susie? Uh, well, I'll give you one. I, I blew up a factory the second year I was in business. <laughs> Sky high, my boss all of a sudden didn't know me. I went down to see his boss in New York, which he pointed me to, and the guy asked me a thousand questions using the uh, Socratic method. And instead of me getting fired, which I thought was a high probability, I learned something from it. So in every one of these events, you got to get yourself back on the horse. And how well you get back on the horse and how well you ride after getting knocked on your butt is a very big deal. We tell our kids, fail early and often. Fail. Because then what happens is when you do fail, you realize it doesn't kill you. You go on living and you realize, okay, you know, I can pick myself up. Here's how I'm going to reinvent myself. Here's how I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to own it. I'm going to say, look, I got fired from the Harvard Business Review. I tell people I was fired from the Harvard Business Review. And, and here's the thing. It gives you um, heart for people who have also fallen down. Sure. And, and you actually sort of have a empathy. Total, empathy, totally different understanding of people who have fallen down. Uh, you've been there and you can, you, you, it just makes you a better person. You don't want to keep failing constantly, but to be scared and of that's it. That's a very bad idea. No, you don't want to fail all the time, but you, but you can't be too scared of it because right. it stops you from doing big things. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I was just having a meeting with a lot of senior executives here at VaynerMedia and I said, look guys, I don't need peacetime generals. 
right? I need wartime generals, meaning I need executives, like of course I know this brand's going well and this brand's going well and this brand's going well. What are you doing about the client that's not happy right now, right? right. And I think failure makes people better at that and so that's another yeah. kind of thing that I look for in this subject matter. All right, let's move on. Chris asks, is terminating the bottom 10% still a good idea? Even on a team of all-stars, someone has to be last. Why don't you set this up because obviously, what was the name yeah. of the person? Chris. Chris knows about your thesis on this. This is a very legendary POV in corporate America, entrepreneur land. Like, this is one of the iconic things you put into the business world. Really quick, faster than normal. Tell everybody what that is so everybody knows and then answer the current version. Actually, when did you come out with that? Give it a little life and then tell me what okay. the 2015 Got version it. of it. Look, if you believe that the best team wins and that business is a game, you've got to feel the best players. So in order to feel the best players, you look at any one point in time, who are your top 20, who are your middle 70, and who are your bottom 10. And you want to take that top 20 and you want to make them feel six foot four and mighty full power. What if they're six five to begin with? S go to six eight. Good. <laughs> and uh, what, what you want to do though desperately is make them know they're, they're that good. You want them to be excited, you want them to turn on, you want them passionate. The middle 70, you want them striving to get that top 20. And the bottom 10, you tell them what's wrong with them, what they're not doing right, you give them a chance. If they don't make it, you let them go. But when you let them go, you love them as much on the way out that's as you loved them on the way in. I'm a big believer in and that. And that's well. a big important thing. I agree. Do you feel that, now you played at a GE, how many, how many employees under your wing on average? 400,000. Four, 4, right, 400,000 employees that you were in charge of during that run as a CEO of GE. Do you think that thesis holds true to VaynerMedia, 500 people? More important. If you were you have. I'm gonna go a little quicker. How about 10, there's a lot of five people teams here. Five to seven people watching on, listening and it, and on the it, other end. And it makes it harder for some because you're looking straight at the five people who got you started. Yep. And it's so tough. I was talking to somebody last night at a conference who said he had to let go his former junior partner and it was killing him, but he had to do it. She wasn't delivering. And I said, look, as long as you take care of her and you're fair and you've explained to her for the last year what she wasn't doing right, you gotta do it. Do you the, think, please, the thing that gets me about this question is, uh, the thing we hear again and again, we hear in this question is, even if everybody, even if it's an all-star team. No okay? such thing. And there's no such thing. You gotta look at your team and say, who is the weakest player? Can I upgrade? Can I upgrade? It's never existed. It's very, very, I mean, you can fall in love with your team and say, now I have the perfect team. But the next manager comes in and says, what was that person yeah. thinking? Yeah, I mean, this look, I have another take take on this too. Why do we always focus on the bottom 10 in this 2017? Why, why, why aren't we saying, how exciting, the top 20? 100%. Why aren't we talking about the winners? Because it's rubbernecking. Yeah. It's the same reason that we sit in traffic all the time, Jack. All right, let's move on. Jeremy asks, as businesses grow, what is the best solution for documenting policy, procedure, and process so all are on the same page? Jeremy. I hate this question for a couple reasons. I, you know, it's interesting. I'm gonna piggyback off the last statement here, which is, to me, this is a defense question, right? This is a bottom 10% question. Yeah. I, 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 there is no business on earth that won because they had a tight handbook situation, right? So, uh, so for me, I mean, unless you're talking about liabilities on a legal level, you know, GE should worry about that to some degree because of the level of lawsuits. And by the way, they have 400,000 employees and there's probably 8,000 lawyers or there's people to do, but a company of 500 people, India, you, you, they're not gonna hear this, and, but you prepped it on like how we have a handbook here and nobody really knows about it. I mean, I mean, this is a 500 person, it's still a baby, like, that is something that I think you need to be worrying about at year 20. Right. Yeah, it's forget like, documentation, have a culture. All you have is the culture. Bingo. And it, as soon as you're documenting things, you're wasting everyone's time, it becomes a bureaucracy, all that matters are your values and your culture, make sure they're being lived and you don't have to document anything. But everybody has to know where you're going, why you're going there, 
and how are you going to get there? Well, that's leadership, right? A absolutely, and that is the job that everybody... That's my job. It's yours and the people that work yep. for you and cascading down. But everybody's got to know the mission. They've got to know how they're going to do it with behaviors. And then they've got to be, be... And what are the consequences of getting there? There's another thing that I think people need to understand. This, and, and by the way, this is going to get very vainerized. And India, you'll enjoy this. And everybody here. As I started bringing in more senior people, they wanted to bring in more of these things. And I made them understand. I'm like, look, you don't understand. We're still this entrepreneurial engine. And if somebody comes into this company and they're so worried about the handbook and so worried about reviews and so worried about all these things, I don't want them here now. Not that they're bad, but they're not the right players at this time. I was the best player on my fourth grade baseball team. There's not a single baseball team in America in Major League Baseball that needs me on their team. So I was the right player for that time, but then as everybody got much bigger than me, I became not so much. And so we now need different people that maybe care about some of those things as we continue to grow, but not at that time. So the other thing here is the right employee at the right time, at the right age of the company. That's really good. Thanks, Adia. Uh, <laughs> yay, boss. <laughs> That's just me getting material over. <laughs> no, no, she, she, you know, it's so funny, back to what we talked about, she wasn't yay bossing me, she's like, oh crap, cool, I have a new article that I can read, because he finally said something different for the first time. Jared wants to know, what's the best way to scale a business with an inherently low profit margin? So Jared's got a, a low profit margin issue. Uh, he's asking the best way to scale it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jack Sears? New products, new innovation, new angle. If you've got, the last thing you want to be thinking about is making large something with small margins. You, you want to find ways to take the assets you have and transform it into a high growth, exciting player in maybe adjacent fields. But take the assets you have and deploy them to grow the business, but not maybe the existing business completely. So get away from the low margin businesses, create services, right? I mean, isn't that what you did at GE? Yeah. You took all the stuff that was low margin and you added on high margin services. You, you don't want to be in a low margin business. You've got to do everything with your innovation and creativity and to, services. To, to get away from it. I'm going to go with an interesting different angle from my own life experience. When I got into my dad's business, it did $3 million in revenue and ran on 10% gross profit before expenses. It was a family business, right? It was, right, right. That was that's low margin. Yeah. The liquor business is bad because there's a middle wholesale part right. that takes 25% of the 50% that a retailer normally takes. Right. Extremely low margin. What I did was actually went the other way, meaning I took the low margin items that were driving the store's business and I actually bet on them. What I did was I took all the items like Santa Margarita, Kendall Jackson, yep. the liquor items that were low margin at cost, by the way, and I used them to market to drive people into the store as the honey and then I merchandised the store and built the brand that they came in for Kendall Jackson but I sold them a different Chardonnay right, right, right. with margin. And so both of these answers are of course right. I'm curious and we don't know where you are in your life cycle. What I've watched a lot of people do is try to go you know, band-aid off from low margin yeah. to some new innovation that maybe the market doesn't want. I think the hedge there that's interesting to understand, I really felt the effects of this, was go, is use it as an offense. Right now, we're testing Facebook ads for my wine business and everything we're using are these low margin items because they have the brand equity to drive in and then we'll take care of it from there. So you may be far enough along in your business where, of, the, the first answers here were 100% right. You need to get into a place where the margins are going to get right, but I worry, depending on your sophistication as an operator, that you go complete cold turkey. There's a way to use the low margin items as an right. asset. That's, right. a, and that's a very good right. idea, but, but I, I would use the low margin items and the margin from those low margin items to invest in other areas. 100%. That's what I did, right? We, the pennies we made turned yeah. into the advertising right. that right. drove people in, then I grabbed them, and so da 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 India. West Coast Beer Geek wants to know, how can efficiency and creativity better work together? They will be inefficient into the time and space you give them, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> I, the, I mean, I was a creative a long time and then I became the boss of the creatives and I knew how much fat was built into their writer's block and their, um, <laughs> you know, thinking and everything. And, uh, the zone uh, they needed. And, 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 and having come out of the Associated the Press where you had to pr turn out seven, eight stories a, a, a day, I, I knew that the creativity expanded into that space. And of course you got to be creative. I mean, creatives need sort of time to decompress and so forth, but I, I would give them a little bit too much 
much, uh, it, it, or maybe not we in general, but it, it is easy to listen to them moan and groan about needing more. Uh, so creatives can be efficient. Uh, hey, well, to, to get efficiency, you got to be creative, and you got to have creative people. And, and efficiency does, does it mean some guy, a woman in a hole, driving every day. It means people that are thinking of new ways to do things, coming up with incremental improvements, making things better every day. Finding a better way every day takes a thinking headset. And you want that mentality in your company. You want the whole company to be thinking about every day, what is a better way of doing what I'm doing now? Yeah. I'm a big fan of betting on your strengths and and also really recognizing putting players in the best position to succeed. If And we have nothing but creatives here of the 500 employees, 200 of them. And if I've deemed, if we've deemed, if Tina, who runs our creative department, mm -hmm. deems that this person is bringing us quality, I think one thing that a lot of people try to do is mold them into being more efficient. I've done that plenty of times in my career. One of the things I've decided now is to look at it more as a net, net game, right? You know, I may not like that they need to be in a zen room with unicorns in it. I may not, but if I'm okay with the output, All right? If I'm okay, net-net, 365 right, day a right, year, right, right. I'll put, I'll take it, right? You could have the most prima donna creative, but if they do that one thing that you decide drives the ROI, on the flip side, you could have somebody who's the most efficient but lacks the magic. What you have to really do is, it's wide receivers in football. Listen, they're at the mercy of the quarterback getting them the ball. That's why they, they don't get to touch the ball. The quarterback touches the ball, the running back touches the ball when it's the calls played. The receivers don't, so many variables. And it's, I'm very intrigued by that psychology. That being said, you know, I value speed and execution mm -hmm. over everything. And so I definitely sit on that Mendoza line if there's a coin toss. If I'm even debating it, if I'm even debating your value as a creative over the efficiency and the output, you're in trouble. Look, uh, one, uh, that's, that's sensational. One of the things, no, it is. Jack. But one of the things that really can kill a company is the innovators sit over here in a box, and they're Thomas Edison, and they're Steve Jobs, the and they're these people, and then everybody else, keep your head down and be a grunt. Yeah. You lose the minds of these people. Hundred percent. Right. You want everybody to be an innovator. Right. 100%. And, and, and it's interesting, here at Vayner, we're a classic agency. We want more practicality from our creatives, and we want our account strategists being creative, and right. it's been a big benefit for yes, us. Right. And it, you know what else it does? It creates mutual respect. Absolutely. Because when the innovators are over here, they sit on a higher ground, right. yeah. and, it, and it deflates the momentum and the equity. Right. And Amen. Right, anytime yeah. you get prima donnas in an organization, it elevates everyone around. So, so let's wrap up with this. We don't do a wrap up session, but we're gonna make a unique thing. Why this book, and more importantly, you have such a mix of people that listen and watch to my show, right? You've got a ton of people in startup entrepreneurial culture. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, because the agency, there's a plenty amount of executives in Fortune 500s, uh, bloggers, media types. When you look at this book, and and you you guys put your self awareness against this book, who benefits the most? Of course, as like wanting the book to be successful, we want everybody, and I'd like it. Would mean a lot to me to support these guys. I want you on it. But who, going down the packing order, who do you think, or how do the individual segments that could read this book, where do you see them benefiting from what angles? I mean, what we want to do is we want to create an MBA in a book because you can start off in business and you can get very good at one thing and then there's something in your head that's saying to you, I wish I had the 360 mindset. You know, that's sort of what an MBA, I got one, what it gives you, it sort of gives you the CEO's mindset. You sort of see all, all the different functions working together and we looked around and that book didn't exist. And so for people who didn't have an MBA, who just wanted one but didn't want to give up two years of their life to go get one. Or the quadrillion dollars. Right, or the, debt. Right, the flexibility, the everything. Yeah. Look, I mean, anybody who's managing anyone, a small team of five people or a team of 500, can use the tools that are in here so to build went, a wild management, team. Management. No, no, no. That's just, one level. Yeah, I know, but that, but it's, it's an yeah. interesting insight that that's where you went first, and I'm intrigued by it. Well, I, he always but, goes there first because he's... Well, I believe in it so much, yeah, so I'm but, into it too. But, but I'm, I'm talking about managing small groups I get as it. well. And, what we want to do is create in an, an atmosphere in a company that's got some of the buzz you got here across every company. So building a wild team and having employees know how to play in a wild team is a critical part of this story. Please. One last thing is that there's a whole section of the book on your career. 
and it's about you know what should I do with my life how do I get out of a career stall and it, how do you become an entrepreneur what does it really take there's all look a lot of the book is about winning strategically smiting your competition building a great team but look frankly people spend a lot of brain time thinking about their own careers and how they get to be where where, they're, where they're really f fulfilled and they're doing what they want to do so the whole there's a chunk of the book about that do you believe on a, on a real quick question do you believe by the way you guys look great in this photo um, do you how many photo how many how long did this photo yeah, should that was take a very longer you know, than with we, me, not for her. Longer than we would have liked. To get me on that to look like that was real work. I know. <laughs> real magic. Huh? I know. <laughs> um, do you believe? Do you believe that a top 25, 50 business school MBA in April 2015 is as valuable in the marketplace as it was? Five, ten, and twenty-five years ago. Go back to top ten. Yeah. Okay. okay. Top ten. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. How about how about it ele slides, eleven to twenty-five? It starts to slide pretty quickly. Uh, at the top ten, the line is out the door with McKinsey, with Booz, with everybody else lined up when you get in. So in a top ten school, you're making a huge three hundred thousand dollar investment. Uh, but the return is pretty good. It to pays change. off. It pays off. Pays off. What about if so many of those kids? Because I now I'm spending a lot of time with those kids. So many of those kids want to become startup entrepreneurs. Right. Do you believe that the ROI is equally as good at not three hundred thousand dollar investment if they want to go down that path versus going to Bain and McKinsey, who start paying them tremendously strong salaries and bonuses that can drive down that? Debt? Depends on the quality of their idea. And let's face it. Yep. I mean, What's your intuition tell you? We are running all we are running all the time into people that want to be, quote, entrepreneurs. It's not a profession. <laughs> it's it's the output okay. of a great idea. Yep. It's not like being a lawyer or a doctor. That's you know, right. What is your idea? What is the value proposition? And can you win with it? Yeah. So I always end the show where I ask a question to my audience yeah. and they answer in the comments. I'm gonna allow you guys, one of you can take it, both of you can have a separate one. Yeah. Um, what kind of question do you want to ask? The, you know, by the way, use this as market research. That's what I do. All right, yeah. I know a question, Jack. I look in, in the book. We make the case that, it, um, that the place you should be working is what we call your area of destiny, that intersection of what you're real, uh, what you're uniquely good at, and what you love to do. Okay, what you're uniquely good at and what you love to do. That's this really rich, beautiful territory, area of destiny. And I'm, I'd love to know how many people think they're actually working in their mm. area of destiny. I love it. Guys, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, guys, go out and get the book. Let's support these guys. Uh, D Rock, let's link it, it up. It all goes to charity. Yeah, hey, every all oh. proceeds to charity. I think that was every nickel. Well, that probably changed the variable of your success of being on this show. So good job, guys. We're gonna sell it. <laughs> you keep asking questions. We'll keep answering them. Awesome. Great. Yeah, yeah thank you. Gary, great. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Best. Oh, you guys thank you, Gary. Gary, now what do we do for you? Oh, the intro. I'm sorry. Now, so what wait, do we wait, do wait, for wait, you? Wait, 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 w